decades, the way that safety has been defined has been around systems. That's how we create safety, right? But community has been left out of that. Victims and families are forced to grieve while navigating a bunch of agencies and systems that are supposed to help them, but end up creating more trauma and victimization in the process. We're launching this campaign and building a movement to put survivors at the center of public safety. So where we are right now is Mendel Plaza. And this is where my brother Mitchell died on January 1st, 2017. He was shot and killed right here where this car is parked. I really believe that's because he didn't get the help that he needed. He could have used access to programs that were really gonna help him or helping him in a way that he felt like he needed help. No matter where I go in the state, I find people that have stories just like mine and my family. Yeah, unfortunately, I got two brothers that, that died. They both were shot 52 days apart in 2008. So we're just living with the, with the trauma that, you know, you can, you can die any day. People don't really understand the full impact of trauma on us, on our families. One in four people in California actually get victim's compensation who were a victim. Some of these protections for victims don't extend or haven't extended to the family members. There's not enough time, people didn't know about it. We could have got victim impact. I never knew that until mm -hmm. you just now said that. Uh, I was shot uh, four times with an AK-47. Do you remember at that time if they offered you like victim's compensation or counseling or any of that? Yeah, I got victims of violent crimes, but it took so long and that was stressful because I was off work. Yeah. Um, it was very stressful because uh, it took so long. It took like eight months. You know, I was really done wrong by the police department. Mm -hmm. The community had told them that, uh, told them who I was. I was a mentor, an advocate in the community, and they didn't care. They just, uh, they just didn't care about what the community was telling them. I told them I didn't know who shot me. They wrote in a the report, I'm not willing to help us or do whatever, you know. I told them I didn't know, like that was the answer. I'm right. shot in my stomach, uh, you know, you right. ask me questions. Right. But see, on the, uh, on the flip side to that, when they write that stuff in your report, you can't get victims of violent exactly. crimes. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, it's, uh, that's a big issue. There's a lot of laws on the books for crime victims and survivors. But unfortunately, a lot of our stories and our needs get left out of it because we are not seen as victims. Well, well, well. Hey, what's, what's up with you? Cozy? How you doing? You were 12 when you got 12, shot. I was about to be 13, yeah. I went home, covered it up, wrapped it up, didn't even say anything. At the time, I would say it made me tougher, but at the same time, now that I know I'm older, it made me more afraid. It's like you feel like you can't escape the streets, so you have to adapt to it. Right. In other communities, when you're a victim or something happens to you, all the attention comes to you. Right. All the resources come to you. But what I'm hearing you say is, you have a situation when you're a victim, you can't even tell anybody. So there is no way for them to make sure that you get any services, right? right. No support. You just opened my eyes. I never thought of myself as like a victim. I just thought like this is part of life. You know, this is this is what happens, what goes on. I know so many people that have been shot, right. been killed. Wait a minute. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> look at my sister. I see you in the gear. Take you look so good. You look so good. I'm so proud. And I'm proud of you, boss. <laughs> the biggest boss that I've seen thus far. <laughs> When I lost my brother, they didn't offer us no services. They didn't, I didn't even know. I had no idea that services existed. That's why we created our own, because we weren't offered nothing. No victim's compensation? Nothing, no, nothing, nothing, nothing at all. The lack of service, services contributes to the repetitive cycles of crime because it's never being addressed. And so we be left to our own devices to do our own, create our own safety. Yeah. I feel like every city, every community should have a lighthouse. 
Like this is a survivor's vision come to life. We come from a space where we were in survival mode. You know, and when I was younger, a teenager here in Stockton, I was actually um, a part of a teen dating violence relationship where I was given two black eyes and a broken nose, but I was only 18 years old. Mm -hmm. 15 years later, I was sexually assaulted and it took LAPD like over two months for me to hear from somebody to help me out. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, I was the one that had to reach out. The justice system is a one size fits none. We don't have enough options. Um, but two, even if the justice system does provide justice as it's currently structured, that doesn't mean that a victim or survivor gets their needs met or the closure that they deserve. Like somebody can be arrested, prosecuted, convicted, and a survivor will still go through hell and not have a place to live, not be able to go to work. So there's a big misunderstanding, misconception about who we are, what we need, and what it takes for us to access that. Sean deserved to be here like anyone else. Can y'all say justice for Antoine Burris? We've made all these sacrifices day to day to humanize Sean, because we know how the system is, and we know how they'll just run with what happened on June 2nd and forever define him that way, and he wasn't that. They don't even see, see us as an opportunity for victims' compensation, like SB 299, you know, families affected by police violence aren't even seen as survivors or, or you know, or victims at that. Good morning, the Public Safety Committee meeting is called to order. Uh, this is Ryan Sherman with the Riverside Sheriff's Association and the Police Officers Associations all currently have an opposed position on SB 299. Persons who, due to their own misconduct, elicit a law enforcement response should not be provided taxpayer funds um, as a result of any injury that should occur. Um, these persons are not crime victims. So where does the support come from if the systems fail you? Honestly, communities what has supported us since day one, and I think we're fortunate enough to have the community that Sean had and our community show up for us. You, you know, being here for us, um, and it sucks sometimes to hear that other families didn't have a community when they lost their loved ones. Me and Ashley have put school and nine to five jobs to the side. There's no funding for families to continue this journey. So for us, we've, we've taken a lot of sacrifices. Too much of safety and justice is defined by systems and other people. When there's conflicts in our neighborhood, all you have, the only option you have is to call the police if there's a safety issue. But to me, safety doesn't rely on those systems. Safety relies on the people. People should get to define it, and people should have the resources at their disposal to be able to do that, to make it real. It's important to recognize that our people do have the capacity. Yeah. We've been doing this. Mm -hmm. Many of these programs are underfunded, especially if they're survivor-led, community-led. They're not funded the same way. A lot of times, these systems think that they're doing that, but they're not rooted or tapped into the people that have the relationships right. with the community, right. so they still miss it. I'm actually working on some stuff to try and get the right people in the right places to have those conversations so that our young people can walk around in their own community and be safe. The people who have been discarded and disregarded by the systems are the ones who are responding to the crisis that we're in right now. They're the same people who showed up in the middle of the pandemic to feed their communities. They are the same people that are showing up for parents and family members after a shooting in their community or when someone is hurt or taken from their family members. They are the ones that have been showing up. All over the state, survivors, and especially in communities of color, have been starting organizations out of their own pockets in their living room to address violence in their communities. The majority of these organizations don't have the support, government funding, or back office to continue doing the work that they're doing. We're supporting organizations like Us For Us, an organization that's on the ground with young people who have been impacted by the system, but have also lost more people than they could count to violence in the streets, and are trying to find a way to save their communities every single day.
I motivate individuals that are like myself, young, strong individuals who are willing to put themselves on the line to get back to the community, whether it be community cleanups, feeding the homeless. You know, I'm giving them something, you know, to love on that's going to give them something back, you know, give them a purpose for real. We're supporting organizations like Kelly's Angels up in Stockton, California, an organization that was started by a man who lost his sister to an incident of DV and was concerned about the needs of her children and all children who are victims of violence. You know, it's just comforting mm -hmm. to see kids take off their shoes and relax and mm -hmm. just be able to, to be themselves. I just wanted to help make sure these kids are all right. I know um, that's, that's our future, so we, we got to invest in it. What I love about Kelly's Angel is that you do focus on the kids because a lot of times that gets left out. There's so much attention on the adults that have to carry the responsibility, the surviving family members, but the children often get left out of that. And that trauma of just loss, especially when it's violence or there's a crime, um, is a lot and it impacts kids in ways that we don't even fully understand, even though we say we do, and for life. We're funding organizations like Lauda uh, down in East LA, an organization that was started in the aftermath of the death of a woman who left four children behind. Responding to the needs of Latino survivors who have language barriers and never get represented in these conversations around public safety. What do you think we need in order for our communities to feel safe and whole? More help, but not through police, like other organizations, yeah. you know? Like Laura people who've been there yeah, uh -huh. and understand. I mean, not even the victim and their families are getting the mental wellness. I speak English and I can't get those resources, you know, for them instantly. Then how is it, how hard is it for someone that doesn't speak the language? Right. When you start seeing this over and over, I'm like, wait, something's wrong. The resources should go to a community and they're not. There should be services here so that's how Laura became. 12 years old, you lose your brother seventh grade. How did that affect you and your family? Man, I felt like a piece of my heart was ripped off. I almost got killed at the age of 17 also. Um, I survived, I survived. I'm very thankful, thank God for that. I'm also thankful for Laura because they're right there for us. They were right there, you know. They're one of the main ones, they're one of the first ones to support. Thankful, that's something that they, they deposited into my life. I, that's something I will never forget. You were 12 years old when this happened, but you remember Lauda being there for you. I remember them, them honoring my brother's death once a year. They'll honor his death and the, the victims around that area, the, them and their families. Um, they'll take us on field trips, you know, for, for healing, you know, healing. As a survivor myself, does it really have to be hard to, to provide a therapy, counseling, healing? Does it? It, it shouldn't. It, it should be part of the bare necessities um, package right. for, for, for a human being. We're now here. Yeah. We're now here and we're creating a movement, a movement that needs to be elevated. Our new public safety solutions have to include survivor-led strategies. We're organizing and bringing thousands of survivors together across the state of California and the organizations that they lead. We're building a movement so that we can redefine public safety. Our voices need to be in the front of this conversation. We're in the streets taking guns out of people's hands and feeding our people. We're in the Capitol having conversations about legislation. Public officials should be listening to and funding survivor-led organizations no matter what's going on politically. They've been doing this work with no support. They need the support to continue serving our communities. It's no such thing as a one man's army. You know, we need each other. We all need each other. A lot of times, you know, when something happens to us, it's almost as if the system says, this is who you are, so deal with the consequences of who you are. And we come back into this space and say, no, this is who we are. We're throwing the rope and we're pulling other people up. We here for the common cause of peace, y'all. We got civilians, we got uh, mothers of murder victims and other people that suffered losses in the community pushing peace now, you know, and to date the longest procession we had was like a seven mile procession when we shut that lay down where when we pushed that love and they felt that love, it changed the whole atmosphere. This movement is for the mamas 
and grandmamas. This movement is for the gunshot victims. This movement is for the human trafficking and DV victims. This movement is for families and people who are impacted by police violence. This movement is for the people who never got the room to see themselves as survivors. This movement is for people who took the darkest, most horrific thing that ever happened to them in their lives and turned it into purpose. This movement is for people like me who can't change what happened to them, but want to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. I'm just grateful that I'm not the only one that decided not to give up. But we are in Sunnydale Housing Development. This is one of the four biggest housing developments in San Francisco. Come on, you're Sunnydale. It's been here 1993. Family Day is beautiful. Y'all been doing this for how many for how many years now? 23 years. My mother just wanted to keep uh, sharing the resources and making sure that everybody in the community uh, knew what resources was in the community. So we used that as a plateau for family day. When I came back from college, I just added to it. Every time something happens, we all gotta relive it. Right. But I think that's why a day like this is so important. You know, some people just see it as a community event, but it's deeper than that. Yeah. I see a lot of hope. I see a lot of celebration. Yeah. That's what we gotta keep pushing. Know that you're not alone. You know, there's so many of us out here that are working through and processing what happened to us, what happened to our families, what happened to our communities, and we need each other right now.